When he was barely 15 years old and still a high school student in his native Brooklyn, Aaron Copeland declared his intention of becoming a composer. The declaration stuck. He not only became a composer, he became one of the most distinguished composers this country has produced. Most will associate his name with a period when he drew heavily upon American folkloric themes for such familiar pieces as Billy the Kid, Rodeo, and Appalachian Spring, the last of which, incidentally, won him a Pulitzer Prize. But Aaron Copeland's work is not stuck in a single moment of time. It reflects the changes in the world and in the man over his more than 70 years. Though he has authored two books and has done some teaching, his occupation has been and remains a creator of music. Mr. Coupland, I, in reading an autobiographical essay by you, I was just trying to recall something you said about quotations. You updated that uh, autobiographical essay and pointed out that once something gets between quotation marks, somehow it's forever the truth, even though circumstances change. And I'm going to use some quotations. So if I go a bit fur far back, why, I hope you'll bring them up to date. I'm thinking, for example, of something you wrote, and I don't even recall when now, in saying that the aims of a compo uh, that you said the objective of a composer is not necessarily to make beautiful sounds like Chopin and Mozart, much as one would like to do that, because one doesn't write the music of one's choice, but of necessity. What is the necessity? What is that necessity the composer must serve? Well, uh, one starts, after all, with themes or rhythms or harmonies that occur to you. Uh, that's, that's the given part. You can't just start writing music out of nowhere, made up of nothing. It has to take a musical form, and it generally takes that form by ideas, musical ideas, mm -hmm. which occur to you. Then after you begin working with them, you begin to have a sense of what the emotional background of that particular theme or, or rhythm or harmony may be. Some seem rather grandiose and powerful. Others mm -hmm. seem delicate and sensitive. Others seem lively and sprightly. Mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, that's the given part. Mm -hmm. You can't take a sprightly theme and turn it into something else without falsifying mm -hmm. it. Of course, you can develop it and find other elements in it. So that I would say pieces begin with that kind of uh, that kind of material, mm -hmm. which is a purely musical material, but which to the composer has an emotional significance. What about the language in which you write it? Uh, you, uh, I, I understand from this quotation that you would not write it in the, langu the musical language of the uh, 19th or the 18th or the 17th century. You've got to write it in the language of your own time? I would yeah. think so, yes. After all, that's the language which is natural to you. Why should I confine myself to the musical vocabulary of the 18th century when Wagner and many other composers mm -hmm. have increased our vocabulary? And okay. nowadays, we use a vocabulary which is influenced by Schoenberg and Stravinsky mm -hmm. and more recent composers than that. But don't most of us listen with sort of what, what I might think of as 19th century ears? Unfortunately, they do. <laughs> Many people do. But the composer's do. not writing for that, then. They are not. No, that's part of the difficulty of the contemporary composer, to get the audiences to sort of, uh, you know, realize what century they're living in mm -hmm. and to lend their ears in a way that would be characteristic uh, of people who live today. They can't hope to have us write our music in the language of the past, mm -hmm. although a great deal of the serious music they hear was yes. written in the past. Mm -hmm. Why can't you write in the language of the past? It wouldn't be natural. Why should we limit ourselves? We have rhythms that uh, Chopin never thought of. We have harmonies. So it's, that a, it's a wider range. Of, it's of a wider range. Mm -hmm. We have a more complex language in one way. Uh, a more um, dissonant language, which can express harsh feelings in a more effective way, I think. Uh, the language of music is really, you know, advanced with the times, and uh, our listeners have to lend their ears in that way. I want to ask you more about that later, but I want to turn time back for a moment, because 
I suppose you were not much thought of today as a rebel in music, but you were when you were young. In fact, you were a rebel when you came off the streets of Brooklyn, what you referred to as one of the drabbest streets in Brooklyn. <laughs> and I, as I recall, you said something about the remarkable thing was that any music ever came out of that particular street. <laughs> That's didn't, true, yeah. Didn't, you came from a, a musical family, though, didn't you? No, I wouldn't say that I came from a musical not family. Really. My sister played the piano and my brother played the violin. Mm -hmm. That means they were sufficiently musical to do that. Mm -hmm. But there are no composers or poets or dramatists that I know about in my family background, and it was a very large family, mm -hmm. so that I felt a little bit like a freak when I decided I wanted to uh, devote my life to the writing of serious music. Do you know what prompted those thoughts? Oh, no, not at all. It was just a natural inclination. I have no idea why it should have happened to me, but it mm -hmm. did. You took piano lessons from your elder sister, did you? Not? In the beginning, in the yes. Beginning, yeah. Then she said to me, well, I've taught you everything I know. You've got to get a real piano teacher now. Where'd you go? I went to a local man in, in, uh, who taught in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. He was a big shot because his studio really was in New York. <laughs> and he only came to Brooklyn one day a week. That oh. meant he was an important guy. Uh -huh. Did he, in fact, teach you? Now, looking back, did he teach you well? Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. His name was Leopold Wolfson. And he had a studio on Clinton Avenue, I remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a good musician. Mm -hmm. Then what went beyond that? Well, then uh, I started to get interested in composition. You see, I started uh, composing short little piano pieces and then gradually to realize that I, I needed a harmony teacher who would tell me about the secrets of harmony. And uh, I found a teacher through Mr. Wolfson who recommended a man called Reuben Goldmark. Mm -hmm who was um, a teacher who lived in New York and whose uncle had been a famous composer in Austria and Hungary. Oh. Um, his name was Karl Goldmark and he had written a famous opera which is occasionally still done called The Queen of Sheba. Um, and he was a good, good man but very academic from my standpoint. He knew about the rules of harmony but if I tried to put anything over on him in the way of more modern harmonies mm -hmm. that weren't in the books yet why he uh, sort of reacted badly. Was that just the uh, rebelliousness of youth that prompted you to break out of the conventional patterns? No, and it wasn't and so the rebelliousness of youth. I got to know music, which was in an advanced idiom at that time. Mm -hmm. The name would have been uh, Debussy and Ravel, mm -hmm. and uh, he didn't go that far. He was a man who dated from the late 19th century and still had the habits of the late 19th century. But was patient enough with you, I suppose. Yes, he, but he insisted on my doing the exercises I was supposed to do. <laughs> I, <see. laughs> I could do what I liked on the side, but for him, I had to do, uh, obey the rules. You then, you after that, went to Europe, did you not? Yes, I and, did. And, and uh, my interest in Debussy and Ravel, of course, made me want to go to the country they came from. Is that and why you chose uh, France? That's partly why. Mm -hmm. Yes, a natural sympathy for French culture. Also, mm -hmm. you see, the Germans were the villains toward uh, the end of the teens. That is, nineteen eighteen. Mm -hmm. Uh, Otherwise, that might have been a logical place to go. It I was for yeah. the generation before mine. Everybody mm -hmm. went to Leipzig and Berlin mm -hmm. to to study music. But my generation connected um, the more contemporary movement in music with France, and Stravinsky was there, and a lot of well, for some reason or other after the First World War, a lot of people gathered into Paris, so that it was an enormously lively. A ten-year mm -hmm. period, as you know, from the twenties to the thirties. Up to that point, you hadn't had too much association with other people interested in composing, I suppose, had you? No, I didn't. I had one or two friends, uh, fellow students with Mr. Goldmark, but otherwise, mm -hmm. I was rather on my own in Brooklyn. Of course, yes. now one associates the name Aaron Copland so much with music that you're going to Paris to study seems not at all unusual. Mm -hmm. But to a boy off the streets of Brooklyn, so to speak, without over-dramatizing it, it must have been quite an experience to go to to Paris alone, to Europe. Well, it was, it was. Uh, I, I really uh, got the courage to go partly because when I was thinking about it, I read about the foundation of a summer music school for Americans, mm -hmm. which was being founded in the Palace of Fontainebleau. Mm -hmm. And I thought, gee, that's a good way of, you know, finding my way around by going to a place that's going to be full of American students, and yet <laughs> in so characteristic a place as the Palace of Fontainebleau. Yes. 
Just imagine what it was like to go from Brooklyn straight to the Palace of Fontainebleau. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. That's a cultural shock. <laughs> that sure was a cultural <laughs> shock. You studied there for a brief time, but it was another teacher there that I guess really was the important influence in those days, was it not? Yes, Boulanger. definitely, mm -hmm. yes. And you know, it took a certain amount of courage. When I first heard about uh, other students enthusing about Miss Boulanger, I thought, well, you know, a lady, uh, nothing, she teaches harmony and counterpoint, but she wouldn't, of course, know about composition. Mm -hmm. So it took a certain amount of um, cogitating and hesitation uh, about the idea of studying composition with a woman. Now, all the uh, women's lib people are going to be shocked by that, but actually 50 years ago, and that's what we're talking about, mm -hmm. um, there had not been any really outstanding women composers, no women Beethovens and Bachs, mm -hmm. for some very extraordinary reason which nobody seems to understand and which I feel pretty sure is going to change, or if it hasn't already changed, and so um, she really had to be very... <laughs> what was she? Well, she had an extraordinary uh, combination of talents, really. She was a very warm and human personality. There was nothing particularly teacherish about her. Um, and she was, uh, she was living in the midst of French culture. Not just musical culture, but culture. And she knew in the musical field all the bright young men, including Ravel mm -hmm. and Roussel and a dozen other French composers of that time, who all seemed to be uh, doing the new thing in music. So she was a kind of a conduit to what was going on yeah. uh, uh, as to the latest thing in music. And she, I remember she used to have Wednesday afternoon teas when uh, you might find anybody there with their latest score. And uh, I remember meeting Ravel there once. I even met Saint-Saëns there. Uh -huh. Now, Saint-Saëns <laughs> was born in 1834. Have you ever shaken hands with a man <laughs> who was born in 1834? <laughs> I did. He, I'm sorry to say he died two months later. But uh, it You was did feel that you were experience. kind of plugged in to a whole history then, right. into a culture. You yeah. were in touch with the liveliest uh, movement in music of the period. Now that's a terrific thing for a young composer of 21 to get in touch yes, with because yes. it just livens your whole spirit. Was that uh, carried on when you came back to New York after three years? It was, was carried on a in, a, in a different way. Mm -hmm. When I came back after having been in, in Paris for three years, uh, I felt there was a lot to do in relation to the introducing of this newer music to the American musical public. Stravinsky in the early 20s was considered to be quite a wild man. The, the Sacre du Printemps was considered almost unplayable mm -hmm. and very savage, with, full of rhythms that scared everybody. Mm -hmm. So that it was a question of introducing that newer kind of music, making it feel normal to listen to. And also uh, another very uh, preoccupying thing in my mind was where were my fellow American composers with sympathies of the same as mine, with whom I could get together so we could sort of push our way into the conventional musical life? Well, you, did get, get, uh, you did get together with some of them through the League of Composers, didn't you? And then yes, the League ultimately of Ultimately with the, with the uh, Copland Sessions performances. Yes, yeah. that's true. We found the League had been uh, uh, established in 1922 or 3, I guess mm -hmm. 23, while I was still in Paris. So that by the time I got back, uh, that was a, a big help, of course. But gradually we do, just wanted to have our own society. And with Roger Sessions, I started these uh, series called the Copeland Sessions mm -hmm. Concerts. It only lasted three years, but uh, we did a certain amount of uh, work that I think was valuable. Why did you switch from that to the use of the jazz idiom then? Well, <clears throat> it was the example of France in part, I think. We were very uh, aware of the fact that the music in France being written at that time was not only new, mm -hmm. but it was French in character, very different from Brahms uh, and Rager, mm -hmm. of a different quality, a different sensitivity, a different uh, feel to it. And it was French because it uh, reflected French characteristics, a certain refinement, a certain sensitivity. Uh, and we thought in order to write our own kind of serious American music, we had to uh, reflect American characteristics. Mm -hmm. So what's more American than jazz? It was a, it was a feeling that uh, through American rhythms of popular music, 
we could immediately have the advantage of using an idiom mm -hmm. that would seem natural to us and perhaps sympathetic to our American A means listeners. of reaching this audience for American composers then, in a sense. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. And creating our, a music of our own, mm -hmm. recognizably our own, you see. Mm -hmm. But you didn't stay with that very long. You, but did two, two compositions? Well, I would say that uh, I stayed with it in the sense that uh, any music I might have written in the years after might reflect jazz elements. And not so obviously as I used them in my piano concerto of mm -hmm. 1927 or in my music for the theater of 1925. But the influence is still there. The influence, of, it's in the blood. Mm -hmm. Yes, I couldn't think rhythms without thinking in terms of uh, what jazz has added to our, our musical language. At some point, you became concerned about the relationship between the composer and the audience, and I mm -hmm. understand that to mean that the audiences were not anxious to hear contemporary composers, weren't anxious to hear the music, and I suspect that it must be terribly frustrating for a composer not to be published, not to be performed, not to hear his own music performed, and much less to have audiences clamoring <laughs> to hear it. It's not only frustrating, it's an impossible situation it to is. find yourself in. Um, so that I felt that it was very natural that one would want to sort of do what one could to make contact mm -hmm. with an audience. Obviously, if you're invited to write a uh, score for a ballet with an American subject, uh, you'd start thinking about American folk tunes of one kind or another. If it were a cowboy subject, you'd look up some cowboy tunes. Hence Billy the Kid and Rodeo. And I think mm -hmm. that would explain those pieces, mm -hmm. yes. And um, in a similar way, the uh, working with uh, such theatrical media as uh, ballet uh, would make me want to occasionally write a piece based on American materials, mm -hmm. which uh, by definition would have a broader audience. I mean, a composer, when he writes his music, has a pretty good sense of who this is going to appeal to. If you write a very severe, dissonant piece for piano that lasts a half an hour, you know that by definition you're limiting the size of your audience. On the other hand, if you have it in you to write such a piece, you wouldn't dream of preventing yourself from doing so just because the audience is smaller. So that uh, a composer generally knows the approximate kind of audience his music might might appeal to. Mm -hmm. He's not fooling himself. And to deny yourself the pleasure either of writing for a very broad audience or for a limited audience seems to me to be foolish. You have mm -hmm. to be realistic about it. I suppose in some cases you're writing not for today's audience but for tomorrow's audience in the sense well, that... Well, in every case you hope you're writing for tomorrow's <laughs> audience. Yes, of course, of course, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but when so many stories are told of the poor reception pieces had in their own time and pieces that we not only True. accept but, of course, uh, love now. Mm -hmm. It's almost as though one has to write for the future. Is, is, what, is contemporary music reflective of, uh, of uh, today's environment or is it kind of predictive of tomorrow's? That, that would be a hard question to answer. Both, I would say. Um, and it's difficult for us to decide now what 25 or 50 years mm -hmm. from now is going to remain and be there just as strongly in the minds of the, those listeners at that time as it may be in our own minds. There's a certain gamble to being a creative artist. Nobody can guarantee you that in a hundred years you're going to be remembered. I don't care how enthusiastic <laughs> your present-day criticisms yeah. must be. Mm -hmm. So that in the end, the, the, the creator must have a sense inside himself that what he is doing is of real importance and therefore will have lasting value. Mm -hmm. But no one can guarantee it. It's a gamble. But it's important. It's it? very, it's the creator, it's very important. Of course. Yes. I think uh, of, of this, uh, this question about uh, the future or the present when I hear contemporary music performed and I am told that if you hear it enough, you come to accept it. Mm -hmm. That's uh, the theory of it, anyhow. That's the theory, of course. <laughs> and I wonder, well, since it seems not to be in tune with my own perceptions of the moment, it's going to be in tune with someone else's perceptions 25 years from mm -hmm. now or 50 years from now, therefore we must be moving in a direction where that kind of thing is going to have to be a natural part of, of our lives and our environment. Mm -hmm. And since it's staccato, since it's dissonant in many cases, angular, mm -hmm. uh, in some cases it seems almost to, me to, almost to me to be spastic. 
It's space. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you put it rather ungratefully. <laughs> I'm afraid, yes, and I, I, I do, I'm doing this obviously yes. with the intention of provoking Balance you somewhat. Yes, yeah. uh, because uh, I am curious to know what it will take to to bring about a, a heightened appreciation of contemporary music, new music. Well, one thing it will take is familiarity. You must be able to hear these things more than once. And uh, more than 10 times would even be better if you lend yourself. Uh, what seems like a spastic rhythm now, 10 years from now, would seem like an exciting one, perhaps. Right. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, it might remain spastic, of course. But uh, things tend to, when they become familiar, to change their uh, character in our minds. The, the proof of it is, of course, the rhythms of Stravinsky, which seems so unconventional at the mm -hmm. time that he first wrote them in the 1918 period, and which uh, seemed almost impossible for musicians, profes professional musicians, to play. Nowadays, you can hear a high school orchestra, almost, not every high school, but the best of the high school orchestras are able to handle rhythms that the New York Philharmonic couldn't handle in 1918 with any ease. That means the skills of the musicians are improving constantly. Definitely. I mean, the rhythm of five-eighths or seven-eighths used to be a drama. Uh, they were <laughs> used to playing two-quarters and three-quarters and four-quarters, but no one had or rarely seen a combination of quick-moving music which changed uh, rhythms in every measure. Mm -hmm. That was really going too far, they said at the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, now everybody can do it because they've become familiar. They've done it enough times so that it's the same as two quarter and three quarter. This new music does offer a real challenge to the performer. It does. Often they, they look strained frequently as they perform it. It must take yes. an intense concentration to... It does, but that was true of every period. I'm sure the first performers of Wagner's operas thought it looked very strange. And that's a satisfaction to the performer, I suppose, to have that kind of challenge thrown at him, isn't it? If he's, an <laughs> if he's a smart cookie, yes. <laughs> if he's an old-fashioned stick in the mud, he'll just resent it. Yeah. But the brighter boys and girls, they, they like to be challenged, and it's a triumph in, in their own minds when they succeed in mastering a new idiom with uh, specific new musical problems. It's interesting that while we're developing this new, highly challenging idiom, which does require attention, concentration, uh, and a, a real depth of interest. We've also developed uh, electronic uh, mechanisms to feed mm -hmm. music into our ears mm -hmm. 24 hours a day and where primitive man perhaps had to listen to stay alive, yes. modern man almost has to non-listen, stop listen, unlisten, I don't know what, what the word is. This must affect uh, the performance of music if we are being conditioned not to give our full attention. It wouldn't yes, I regret that very much. Mm -hmm. I wish that when people are not in a mood to listen to music that they would turn the darn thing off mm -hmm. because that kind of casual bathing in musical sounds without listening to it, that's not at all the composer's idea. Mm -hmm. If you want to really listen to what he has to say, listen. Otherwise, forget it. You know, mm -hmm. Don't just let it on there as a, like wallpaper on a wall that just is around sure. you because it makes a kind of pleasant sound. Uh, when uh, the, um, uh, you did at one point uh, uh, in your life uh, write functional music. Uh, what, oh, what I might write functional music. You tomorrow. still write functional I music. I might, yes. What, what is functional music is distinguished from the sort of thing we've been talking about? Well, if you uh, are a movie producer and director and you make a movie, you have to have music in certain parts of the film in order to help your film. That's just a convention, though, I suppose, isn't it? It is a convention, but sometimes it really is mm -hmm. necessary, and mm -hmm. it can heighten the emotional feeling of a, fi of a mm -hmm. particular film scene. That would be functional music mm -hmm. in the sense that the music is, is serving a specific function to help the effectiveness of a different art. Uh, in the same way, I suppose, a ballet score is functional music uh, or any dramatic score that mm -hmm. accompanies a spoken play at, at times. It's that music that's not performed in the concert hall then no. simply for, for concert no, it, So it serves that function in each mm -hmm. case. And here, I suppose, the challenge of the composer is somewhat different in that he has to serve the function in addition to serving his own uh, creative impulses. That's true, but it's a special satisfaction, actually. You see, I've written the music for five or six films and uh, I've had the experience of seeing a film, pl uh, a film scene played without any musical accompaniment. 
and then imagining what kind of music could heighten the effectiveness of that film, make it seem more tender, more touching, mm -hmm. or more exciting, more frightening. Uh, and I've written such music and then heard it put to the film for the first time. And that's really quite an experience because it, it does do things to a film scene. Uh, sometimes it might be uh, over obvious. It might get in the way by being either too loud or or in some way a jaw with the uh, mm -hmm. scene you're looking at. But uh, you can make a sick boy seem much sicker <laughs> and you can emote with him much more tenderly if there's uh, if music going on. You might not be uh, consciously aware of the fact mm -hmm. that the music is going on, but it might play on your emotions. So much the event. better if you're not aware, I suppose. So much the better. Yes. If you're musical, you'll hear it. I mean, if you tend to listen to music, you, you'll It'll hear it whether you want to or That's not. That's right. Mr. Couplin, I, I, you said earlier that every composer wants to be remembered a uh, hundred years from now, and I suppose any composer like yourself would wish to be remembered for everything he has done. What would you most like to be remembered for among the, the, the works that you have done? Well, I've been asked that question before. So you must have the answer. Like <laughs> I have the answer already. <laughs> it's like asking a mother which is her favorite I, child. Yes. You know, you like one for one reason, perhaps because nobody else seems to like it. Um, you like another because everybody seems to like it. Why shouldn't you join mm -hmm. in, you know? Uh, you, you like one piece because it took so much labor. You worked so hard on it mm -hmm. over such a long time. And it took, uh, it seems, such a difficult birth, you might yeah. say. Uh, on the other hand, some things came so easily that you feel happy about the fact that they came that easily. So you have different reasons for liking different pieces. Thank you very much.